Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the last panel of this event. Uh, I'm thrilled to see such a full room. You're, you're the diehards. You're the ones who lasted almost to the, end, to the very end. Uh, before I get started, I do want to alert you that we're going to have closing remarks after we're done with the panel and then a musical performance. So please do stick around. <laughs> Welcome to the Quest for Leadership 4.0. I'm Amy Bernstein. I'm the editor of Harvard Business Review. And uh, today we're just going to try to pull together the threads of all of the thinking that has been going on over these past few days. Uh, as we all know, there's We've been seeing sweeping technological and other changes uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. And these changes are profoundly changing, shifting the ways that governments and businesses operate. The question facing us is how can leadership become more responsive and responsible to confront the enormous scale, complexity, and urgency of the world's challenges? Our objectives today are to provide a framework for business leaders to effectively promote change beyond their own company, to make the case that corporate leadership is responsible for more than creating shareholder value, that it must also encompass the interests of employees, partners, the environment, the community, and society at large, all the stakeholders. And we want to foster a discussion that facilitates best practices for leaders across the world. We're going to discuss these questions with our distinguished panel today and pull you into the conversation maybe halfway through. So if you have questions, hold on to them. Let me start with introductions starting at the end. We have Yiping Huang, who is the Deputy Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University here in China. Thank you. Next to Yiping is Michelle Zatlin, the co-founder and chief operating officer of Cloudflare, uh, one of the conference's young global leaders. Michelle, just tell us a little bit about Cloudflare. Uh, Cloudflare, we are about nine years old where I'm an entrepreneur and our mission is to help build a better internet. Our customers are internet properties and we help make sure that they are fast, secure and reliable around the world. And so it's been an amazing nine years. We have over 16 million internet properties that use Cloudflare um, and help make the internet safer, faster and more reliable for a large percentage of, of, um, uh, of internet requests. Great. Next to Michelle is Supachai Chairavanant, the CEO of CP Group in Thailand. Supachai, tell us a little bit about CP Group. Yeah. CP Group is an agro-based uh, food company. We, uh, you know, in the past 30 years, you know, diversify into you know, retail distributions, telecom media, and you know, a few other sectors. Um, we are we invested in about 21 countries and traded uh, more than 100 countries around the world. Uh, we are 98 years old this year, and I'm the third generation mm -hmm. of family, family members. Terrific, thank you. Next to Supachai is Inas Abo Hamed, who is a fellow at the Royal Academy of Engineering at Imperial College London, and she's one of the conference's young scientists, but you're also the founder of a very early stage startup, right? Tell us about that. So uh, H2 Go Power is an energy storage company. We store energy in the form of uh, hydrogen. So we take renewable energy. Instead of compressing gas up to high pressure, we convert it to solid state. And that gives the user the benefit of storing energy for long durations. Seasonal storage is the focus of the company. Okay. Great. And finally, next to me is John Miko, the Global Chief Strategy Officer of Deloitte USA. Thank you. Um, let's start with a question I, we actually put to you all a couple of days ago. We asked you to think about what it means to be a leader. We asked you this at the very start of this conference. Now that you've spent the last three days thinking about 
being a leader in 2019 and beyond. How has your view changed? Michelle, let's start with you. You know, I think being here over the last few days in, in Dalian, um, you know, you, you mentioned your opening remarks about the all of the fast rate of change that is happening um, and touching businesses around the world. And you know, when I when you asked me on, on Sunday what my definition of leadership was, it was pretty pretty straightforward. It was the act of motivating a group of people towards a common goal. And I still think that's the case. I think what has changed over my few days here is the fact the 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 context of which being a leader is and how fast things are changing. And I don't it's not going away. And you know, as a leader, you can't just cope with the change going on, you actually have to be the one driving it within your organizations or your communities. And if, because if you don't, you will be disrupted. And I think that's one of the kind of um, highlights that has changed for me spending the last few days here in, in China. Superchai, you run a company that is nearly 100 years old. How does what Michelle say sound to you? I, I agree. In fact, uh, leaders uh, is, is to create values. And to create values, um, leaders have to constantly make change. Mm -hmm. And now we are not only have to constantly make change, but in fact, uh, we are seeing a lot of disruptions, technologies which are making change, the dynamic of this uh, geopolitical environment. So we have to uh, adapt and be able to, to lead the change. So leaders usually um, uh, can become a clear leaders during this time, the kind of times that actually nobody <coughs> knows where to go, or you know, in most of the time, you know, a darkest time or darkest moment for the company, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, 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 the, it's really a testing the, the leaders out as well, the way we are seeing the changes that are happening through the technologies, you know, political environment, uh, new super economic power like China uh, coming up if you are multinational businesses. Mm -hmm. And Asked, you are sort of at the beginning of your corporate leadership career, and I'm wondering how your view has changed over the last few days. Um, so um, I, I want to share my opinion about like what a leader looked like and how this uh, meeting changed my opinion by uh, sharing a, a story from a video that I watched. Uh, so in this video, basically, uh, there's a park full of people. They were all uh, assembled at the bottom, and there's a hill. One person stands out and go uh, stand at the hill and start dancing. Everyone in the park <coughs> looks at them like in a very weird way. And after a few minutes, one person joined that person who is dancing. And then after a few minutes, a few more people joining them. At the end, the whole park joins the person who started the dancing movement on the hill. And everyone in the park is, is, is dancing. And what I've learned from um, from this meeting is that first person who took the bold move to stand on the hill and start dancing and got everyone in the park who looked as, uh, as them as weird people in making that move have to be very careful with every move they make because they will have the entire park doing exactly what they're doing and it's their responsibility and this is, this is how this, this uh, meeting changed my uh, how we see uh, responsible leaders. John, you're in the business of helping leaders lead better. Mm -hmm. How has your view changed? I, I question whether it's changed. I think it's confirmed a few things. Yes. Uh, I, clearly, you know, it's been talked about that rapid change of uh, technology, rapid change of business model and pace. So clearly about leaders leading in an, in an uncertain environment. Um, but I think it's an interesting one, that the, um, the video that's talked about. I'm not sure everyone wanted to dance. Mm -hmm. and so I think you've got to be prepared to say, uh, try and sort through <laughs> what is reality and what's not. And I, my, one of my worries is you hear so many things and you know, so many things are going to completely change our world, some of them won't. And so I think there's a chance of getting caught up in the hype rather than being, as a leader, I think you have to have very clear direction, sense what's happening, but also be willing to stand against that tide at times and say, you know, we have a purpose, we have a clear direction, and I'm going to stay with it. So I think that's the challenge for a leader, is sorting out what the reality is and, what, and what's not. Mm -hmm. And Yiping, finally, I wanted to get your view on this. You're very mm. focused on Chinese corporate leaders. How is this all hitting you? Well, I, I think uh, good corporate leaders are probably very much alike all around the world. 
one of the a particular challenge that the Chinese corporate leaders now face is the change of the growth model. Um, so for instance, our GDP per capita was 2,600 US dollars in 2007. Last year, it became almost 10,000 US dollars. That significant rise basically changed the growth model. 10 years ago, our Chinese companies can just rely on low cost advantage to produce things, export to the world market, and build a very successful model. Many of these experienced significant, significant difficulties last 10 years, and now you can find only the ones that are able to innovate and upgrade their industry, so their, their production are able to survive. And I think this is probably one of the most significant challenges facing the companies. But we are also seeing a lot of innovators around China. You look in the internet space, the BAT, even in the more traditional, for instance, um, industries like uh, um, the white uh, uh, electronics. Uh, we used to have a lot of uh, um, brand names in electronics products in the Chinese market. Most good ones are foreign brand names, like from the US, from Germany, from Japan, and even Korea. But nowadays, you find a lot of these good brand names are Chinese. So you can see whether it's in really new industries like 5G or AI, but also traditional industries like uh, um, air conditioners or, or washing machines. You're seeing this rising, and I think this is the test for everybody, certainly everybody in the corporate world in China today. And that is only the beginning. Um, this is probably a process will continue for quite a while. How is it testing leadership, though? Well, um, leaders are very different in terms of uh, uh, the Chinese corporate managers. The first generation of uh, um, the corporate leaders, a lot of them were actually parents before they started their own businesses. Mm. Um, so they were all very good in managing the production process and so on. But to, uh, to some extent, we experienced this some kind of a generational change. Mm -hmm. For many companies, you actually had a crisis because you now need a very different group of corporate leaders to lead the, the, the company. So that's why you distinguish. Some comp good companies in the early days continue to um, survive. Others um, facing significant difficulties and even fail. Interesting. So, Anas, I wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit about your argument that leaders need to think more like scientists and act more like entrepreneurs. What, what do you mean by that? Um, so basically, if we want to achieve responsible leadership and really uh, look to improve the type of leaders that make long-term decisions that's going to bring back benefit to society uh, and us as people who elect them, we really want them to uh, integrate uh, science and evidence-based uh, facts in their decision making mm -hmm. because some of the decisions take very long time to implement and once they are implemented they are irreversible and that basically process means that we really want to reduce the probability of get getting uh, decisions wrong and if we base our decisions uh, on evidence and facts and think like scientists because that's what scientists do uh, or increase the influence of scientists in the decision-making uh, 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 circles, we basically will make better decisions. The quality of the decisions will, will be made better. And I'll give you an example of that. In the 50s, scientists said there is climate change coming. And nobody listened to the scientists. We did not give them enough influence to do things about climate change and uh, mitigate it and try and reverse it back in the days. And the result is that today we are under an emergency operation of what do we do with climate change, how we mm -hmm. reverse it, how we mm -hmm. mitigate it. If we have dealt with it at the right time when the evidence was there and the scientists said there is uh, a, a climate change problem, 
I think now we would be focusing on other problems to solve and maybe like focusing on more economical growth. Um, and by acting like an entrepreneur, which is the, the second part of, of the statement, um, entrepreneurs are the ones who see a gap in a system or a process and they act on it uh, efficiently with hustle and agility and come up with a solution and then scale it. And I think this mechanism of dealing with the gaps in the system uh, makes, difference, uh, makes a difference uh, quite fast. And this is something that would be appreciated if leaders would do. Amy, sure. but, yeah, I think there's a challenge there, though, because I think there's essence of, of uh, agree in both those. But certainly when you're dealing with much bigger organisations, it's also how do you actually cater for both areas? And I think, interesting enough, given the rise of mach machine learning, given the rise of AI, I think leadership will be far more in the end about going back to things like intuition, creative mm -hmm. problem solving, creativity, empathy. So I think you actually got a movement of, we, we talk about movement from the hands to the head to the heart. Right. And you'll see this much, <coughs> alignment, much greater alignment with social purpose, much greater alignment with customer value. So, so I think the challenge for leadership is clearly using as much evidence base as you can, clearly trying to have an organisation agility, but then it is how do you actually empower people and have this collective and collaborative leadership that really drives a, a, you know, a, a large workforce in a big organisation. Right. You know, Superchai, you, you run a company with values baked into them. You, would you talk a little bit about CP and, and, and that kind of moral compass you use, the ethical compass you use when you go into new businesses and so forth? Yeah. Yes, um, just, just before that, I would like to uh, paint the background a little bit. Um, CP Group started from the industry 1.0, which is uh, vegetable seed shops in the Chinatown, long time ago. And then during um, the second generation, they actually industrialize. You know, they actually produce products that can be um, distributed throughout you know, the country or around the regions and all that. And then we come the age of uh, third industrial revolutions. And it's, it's actually a, a flow of capitals. Capitals that drive uh, everywhere that actually give uh, best returns, more or less a market-driven economy. And we are in the fourth industry revolution, um, evolutions, and it's, it's about, uh, people talk about data, uh, information, um, digital assets. Um, we, are, we are going into this new economy whereby uh, a lot of uh, digital technology or converging of the different <coughs> technology through computing and digital technology is happening. And uh, we see uh, big players uh, that are replacing certain um, service areas. Uh, but there are also still a lot of brick and mortar and uh, physical elements of the economy. Uh, that's why we are all, you know, uh, sitting here, we are physical based, more mm -hmm. or less. Mm -hmm. So you have to look into all these uh, changes and then you come, come back and look at yourself. Um, fourth industry um, evolution is, is not only um, about data, but we are talking about how to make the world more sustainable because we're entering an era whereby uh, there's exponential speed of change that not only impact um, our business, but impact the social and environmental issues in a speed that they were, we never faced before. Uh, the waste, the consumption rate that we are, are growing, the waste that we are producing, um, the, the, we might really, you know, I myself, I'm 52 now, mm -hmm. I may, might really live to see, you know, really a, a cloudy, dark sky, you know, a toxic oceans, uh, air that we might not be able to breathe very well with, you know, um, if we do not change. And, and that's sort of a parallel, um, an integrated issue of the new business models. You know, the, the, the business going forward, you cannot leave behind uh, the issues that you cannot create these liabilities <coughs> without responsible for what happens. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, um, how to integrate 
the business itself mm -hmm. with the sustainability issues mm -hmm. um, is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, sustainability issues touches um, the very core of so-called business values. When we, when we talk about governance, we talk about a really uh, best way to, um, to address our shareholders and stakeholders, right, right on the governance. Um, when you touch a very core of the, the values, you're talking about how can you maintain and be able to sustain those, those values across. Now, uh, one of the very key um, um, values that the, the CP group uh, embraced it long, since a long time ago is so-called three <coughs> for sustainability. Mm -hmm. So where will we invest or where, you know, where will we do business? We wanted the, that country to benefit first. And then second is the people in the country. We should, we should actually create values for them. And then the company can create the values. So that, that kind of uh, mentality is in our core values. You know. um, again, I, I still recall when I was younger that um, the, the story about CP Group at the beginning is that we first put the seeds into the envelopes that actually at that time are growing uh, by all this, uh, my, my father's generations. Uh, on top of that envelope, uh, the, my grandfather said that you have to put in the expiration date. Because if not, the farmers will lose the whole season of plantations. Mm -hmm. And it is not being honor, honest, honest to, to our customer. So the first principle is about caring. You know, when you talk about the very core of governance, and the very core of uh, all the regulations we are putting out is actually about caring and collaborating. So, um, so the, uh, I was fascinated by this story because you've built values and purpose into the, it, you've woven it into the fabric of CP. Michelle, you have a, a startup company. I'm wondering how you think about purpose and values with your organization. I mean, it's been critical to our success. Um, you know, I'm based in San Francisco, the Silicon Valley. Uh, it is incredibly difficult to hire people in the Bay Area. It just it's it is incredibly competitive. Uh, and you know, as an entrepreneur, you're facing lots of challenges every single day when you start a company, and most fail. And very early, we realized that. Um, we're not just starting a business to, to drive ROI. I mean, of course you want, you want your shareholders to do well, but like we have a mission as a company and our mission is to help build a better internet. And we didn't start with that kind of aha, but very quickly within a couple of years of starting the company, we realized how important it was to have this greater pr purpose. And when you have a mission as a business or a purpose, all of a sudden it's easier to attract people you need to be able to execute on what your business does. And, and it becomes a huge competitive advantage. And so in this market, which again, we are, we are in a very competitive market uh, for, for great talent, all of a sudden people were willing to come join as employee number 30 at a company that was just an idea. Mm -hmm. Because they said, I wanna be here, I wanna do the best work of my life, and if we achieve what we think we can achieve together as a team, I will have a lasting impact. And, and, and that was, a, 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 again, a huge advantage to us as, as entrepreneurs. And you, know, you see so many companies who do this. Again, your company is 100 years old, which is amazing, and a lot of new companies who say, okay, we, we are passionate about something, we care about it, let's go build a business about it, and that's how you assemble a team. And it wasn't just the people who came to work at Cloudflare, it was our investors. You know, we've again, raised a lot of um, capital to build our company, over $300 million US dollars, which is a lot of money <coughs> for a private company. And the investors were excited to be part of this. They wanted to help make the internet better too. They saw there were issues, there were challenges, and they said, wow, I wanna bet on you to be able to go solve this because if we achieve it, I would be so proud and I think it'll drive business results. And so for us, it was able to attract an amazing team. It's been able to attract investors who give us the, who, who enabled us to get our business off the ground. And now today, you know, we're eight and a half years old. We have you know, 1,100 people around the world. We have 12 offices. And today, it's the reason why customers choose to want to do business with Cloudflare too. It's they want to be, they don't want to just buy from a vendor. 
I mean, they want to buy, they want to, they want to say, what are you really trying to achieve as a business? And when they hear about it, they're like, wow, I want to be part of this as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think this idea of purpose, I, I think of it as mission, but I think they're really interchangeable. Right. It's been really critical to our success. It's allowed us to create a great team, our customers um, and, and investors to be able to go execute and help overcome a lot of the risks that stand, a lot of the challenges that stand in front of you when you're starting a business. May I add just a little bit more here? Yes, please. Things starting with the, the values and the purpose is, is actually most important because uh, you know, CP Group been through this uh, already uh, number four industry revolutions. <laughs> and the, the thing is that the values never change. Mm -hmm. Th those values uh, that embedded carry you along all these changes. So I think it's uh, certainly very important. It's John, amazing. Have you 10 years, 100 years old, and your values haven't changed. I mean, that's really Yeah, it's incredible. an extraordinary story. Mm -hmm. John, are you seeing your clients grappling with this question of mission and values? How, what, are, what are you seeing? Very much. And, and, and it, you know, the key is not only having a very clear mission or purpose, but, but then also living it, you know, which I think, because we've all seen lots of value statements or lots of mission statements, and then... Yeah, how do you take the effort. plaque on the wall yeah. and make it real? Um, and I, I mean, I'll use our example, not, not to sell Deloitte, but, it, but it, it's, it's very similar. I mean, we have 300,000 people, so I mean, obviously that's a, an interesting challenge. But we, we use a thing that's called make an impact that matters for our clients, our people, and our communities. Uh, and that's been unbelievably effective. I mean, it's no different to, I think, what's huh. being talked about. I think it's incredibly important because it, I think you can define it too, too tightly. The beauty of making an impact that matters is it's, it's up to each individual client, each individual person and community what matters. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's really is what, what's valuable for them. And so we find it incredibly empowering that for each person that works for us, each client they're working for, an, an impact that matters will be different. Will yeah. be different. Um, but that's become a very um, defining um, sort of purpose for us. And I, and I think it, it is the thing, uh, you know, I agree with the other speakers around, if you get that right and people are working to that purpose, purpose and feel inspired, then it, you'll actually create value for the company. Uh, but ours is very much defining clients, people and community rather than for <laughs> Deloitte. Yi Pink, how does this sound to you? you it's, well, I think these challenges that we also face in many Chinese companies. Um, pursuing um, stable value um, and uh, uh, to trying to fulfill some mission. I think this is the same for all these companies. One particular issue, and I think uh, uh, just uh, Sobcha just mentioned about the implications of um, the fourth industrial revolution, that certainly poses a lot of challenges for the corporate world. One area I've been focusing on a lot in my research is a financial technology. Mm -hmm. Financial technology is really changing the financial industry and you can find a lot of new innovations. For instance, the digital payment. It's becoming a daily life. You, you, can't, you can't live without the, the payment service. But you're also seeing a lot of businesses building on these payment services. For instance, online lending. Um, by our online banks, uh, okay. they lend um, millions and millions of loans every year without even seeing the customers. These are the benefits you get from the innovation, um, and that's the benefit of the digital technology. The problem I think with many companies face is also how to balance the benefit of innovation but the potential risks coming with it. So for instance, um, the good example I just mentioned, digital payment and online lending. We also had a lot of problems in the so-called peer-to-peer lending platforms. In fact, they are literally lending lots of money um, and uh, also gathering lots of money, but also create a lot of risks. There was a one single um, platform, for instance, uh, which collapsed at the end of 2015. Um, it burned lots of, lots of money, but most importantly, the platform goes down with almost about a one million investors. So I think that's something um, this is now facing um, the, the, the most of the Chinese corporate leaders. You do want to adopt the new technology to either improve your efficiency or to expand your financial inclusion. But at the same time, 
how do we maintain financial stability and remain responsible, not just, just to your stakeholders or shareholders, but also your customers. I mean, they invest the money in your platform and the money disappeared after a while. I mean, that's something I think we really needed to look at now. So I'm going to ask the panel one more question and then I want to open up the floor to you so you can ask questions. I'm going to change the topic just a little bit. Michelle, you and I attended a session this morning. I think it was called Leadership Without Leaders. So I want to ask about the need in this, in, given all of the pressures and complexity that leaders face in the 21st century. What did you, what was your, what were your thoughts about this notion of um, pyramid type leadership, hierarchical leadership, giving way to flat leadership? Sometimes we call them circles. What were your thoughts when you were standing there? I think that, so my thoughts at, the, at this panel where the discussion around um, leading without leaders is ultimately, and the, the, from, the pan, from the discussion is, you need, it ultimately doesn't work. Um, and so, but it doesn't mean that it's a pyramid top down. And so I, what you want, how I always think about, the model I think about, um, and, and that discussion just highlighted it for me, was, you know, as the CEO of Cloudflare, I want to make sure that the ideas come from everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Across the organization, right? Great ideas, the next thing we should build, I want that to flourish. Risks that we aren't thinking about, I want those to flourish. You want to be an organization that is open enough that allow all these ideas to flourish and come up. However, you need to have enough structure to allow everyone to operate and know what they're doing so you can actually get things done and ultimately deliver results, which is what really matters. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think that is the balance that as a leader in an organization um, and as teams as you assemble an organization that are really important. It's where there's enough structure that people understand, okay, this is what I'm responsible for, here's my role, who do I, who, 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 who is, who's my manager who can give me feedback whether I'm doing a good job or not, if I want to ask for vacation time, who do I ask? I mean, employees need that to be able to do their best work. And then you need a an organization flexible enough where they can, where you, as a colleague you can go talk to somebody else, whether they're more senior or more junior, so those great ideas or the risk can surface so that ultimately the business can flourish. And I think that that is the, the juxtaposition where there's enough structure that people feel, yep, I can do my best work, but flexible enough to, to let the organization morph and, and, and change. And so when I was at the session this morning, it just reaffirmed that yes, people need, need leadership, but organizations also need to be very flexible. Yes, so Anas, as you're building your company, how do you think about leadership style and, and structure? So uh, I really want to go back to the uh, point that we already talked about, which is the impact. Mm. I don't think no leadership work in an organization where you're trying to build something new, mm -hmm. you'll create a mess. It's, it's inevitable because there won't be a direction. You really want the leaders to convince the employees or the people who are capable of building things together that their contribution is gonna create the impact and your responsibility as a leader is to help them with the direction. Once they are convinced in the direction, they will do their best to structure the business and uh, move it forward and create the impact that it was like set up. The structure was set up really to achieve it. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have the right type of leaders who can convince their employees that this is the direction that we want to move forward in order to achieve the impact that we set up to do. John, how do, how do your clients, how, how has their leadership style changed? Uh, it's, it's changed somewhat and I think it's got to change a lot more. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think the challenge, we've lived in a very control-based, ERP, process-based world. Right. Um, so I think we still have too much command and control mm -hmm. um, and you know I, I suppose big organizations have survived that way because they've been much more risk-based mm -hmm. um, I, I think that clearly has to change and we, we are seeing that absolute need for leadership to be very clear I agree with the, the comments before very clear about direction mm -hmm. you know, that ability interesting enough probably more now so than ever that ability to look out long term and set a very clear long-term <laughs> direction but I I think it's a, a big shift. I, you know, I, I always use a range of words. I, you know, I think it's going from 
directing to orchestrating it. Mm -hmm. It's going from sort of being exclusive with information and knowledge to, to mm -hmm. much more inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're moving from the sort of heroic type leadership to more collective and collaborative and, and moving from sort of functional to much more systemic. So, you know, it is, it is quite a shift of saying, how do you actually empower people to create value for customers? How, how do you actually um, sort of inspire a workforce rather than a command and control? So, so I think, it, you know, certainly at the big organisation end, I think you're going to see some quite significant shifts over the next five to ten years as we, as we use more of things like AI and, and machine learning, et cetera, to take away some of the process. It's then about inspiring people around really creating customer value. Super Chai, your, your business has passed from generation to generation. And I'm wondering what you will tell your son or daughter about leadership that's different from what your father told you about leadership. That's a difficult and sensitive question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, hmm. I think, uh, let me put it this way, let me compare you, our existing educational system <laughs> with this the 4.0 educational system, how you want to change a school principal, how do you want to change uh, your teacher. <laughs> so uh, in the old days, you know, teachers is the center of knowledge. So in fact, when you call teachers, you call them instructor. From the industrial age, you want uh, really a commander. You want people to hold on to their function and their responsibilities you know, to make sure that all the products come out with high quality. Now, in this age, you want to change a teacher from the instructor to a facilitator. Because knowledge is abundant. Students or the young people, young workers, they can <coughs> access, they can have access to knowledge. They can make research that you have done years in the past within two weeks mm -hmm. or maybe less. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is best that the new leaders look at things from the perspective of how can you encourage and facilitate those abilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our, sorry, can please, please. But please. I agree. Although the interesting thing is I think organizations of the future are going to become learning organizations. <laughs> and, yes. and I think it's going to be that learning <laughs> on the job is going to be almost more important than te technical or formal learning. You know, we've had a probably the last 20 years where it's, it's been important to get two degrees and formal learning, and I'm not dismissing that in any way, um, particularly with a professor on the panel. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I think this interesting, if you go through a world where we're adapting and changing, I think big organisations particularly, but all organisations, one of their key roles is how do they train people on the job and allow people to adapt and learn and, and shift. So the learning organisation and the teaching is becoming incredibly important within an organisation. So, Professor? Well, I, I mean, I, I do think uh, um, the implication of the so-called fourth industrial revolution means innovation becomes a, a daily phenomenon. So whatever uh, management skills that the managers apply, you should, should be able to facilitate innovation and encourage everybody to participate. But while I was listening to uh, my uh, uh, fellow panelists talking about which uh, management style would, would be better, I was also thinking um, in the Chinese internet and the fintech space, you actually saw different successful models. So for instance, Alibaba and Alipay were more or less uh, built um, on the basis of a vision and idea from the leader of the company, and everybody was mobilized to implement that idea. Mm -hmm. It's been very successful. On the other hand, if you look at uh, um, the Tencent's WeChat and WeChat Pay, they were initiated uh, um, and developed in more decentralized way. Mm -hmm. Both, I must say, been very successful, but in general, I would certainly would agree whether the idea is from top down or from bottom up, 
um, I think we need to facilitate this innovation process in the entire company. So that is a significant change from what we rely on in the past. What we call resource-driven uh, uh, growth model, essentially just the increasing input, the economy expands. And then now you need to rely on innovation. So I think in general, that management style needs to change. We already see in, uh, um, the companies that can be distinguished based on this capability. Great. All right. Enough of me. Hmm. How about you? Do you have questions? Hmm. Would you raise your hand? Yes, I see a question here in the front row, and I think there's probably a microphone coming your way. Yes. Thank you, panel, for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. It's, it's the most perfect way to conclude uh, the last three days that we've been here. Uh, I'd like to go back to agility for a second. Um, and we talked about agility in the 4.0 world. Um, it's, it's not a novel, novel concept. You know, I uh, go back to one of my favorite HBR articles, and uh, Ms. Bernstein, I'm not pandering here. Um, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an article about Race to the South Pole, where there's two teams, one from Norway, one from England, and the Norwegian team is just so agile. Uh, my question is, as we go into this 4.0 world, is there, is there such a thing as too much agility, especially when we know that there are some investments that require time, uh, that are more durable changes that require that persistence? Are we pivoting to a culture of too much pivoting? Interesting question. Michelle. There was an entrepreneur, a, a, a San Francisco-based entrepreneur, who wrote a, a blog post, a reflection, about how his two agility, I mean, he kind of described it schizophrenic decision-making, but it's another way of saying agility where he kept seeing all these shiny objects killed his company. Where they, they built a really successful company that had over... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, they, they, had, they had a ton of adoption, real revenue, they were doing so well, and then he just kept chasing all these shiny objects, and ultimately he had to shut down his company. And this was, they'd raised money, they had employees, they were happy customers, so it, absolutely. I mean, leadership matters. I mean, just because you have a good market, a great team, absolutely does not mean that you're gonna win, right? It's what your acts are every day, how you execute, and, and so leadership really matters. And, and again, I think it was really brave of him to, to post this article and kind of share that learning with the rest of us as a reminder that mm. what you do every day matters. And so yes, agility, I mean, again, I think it's great to be agile, but you can't have whiplash. But yeah, and I think, I think we have to be very careful of, of giving agility a bad name. Uh, you know, to me, that sounds like complete lack of strategy and lack of vision, right? <coughs> so, I mean, I think, there's, I think you need to be agile, but you, you're agile within having a very clear direction and a very clear strategy and vision where you want wanting to go. So the challenge is we use, we throw these words around all the time. I mean, I think organisations will need more agility, but, but that doesn't say you don't have a strategy, you don't have a, a direction, a vision of where you're going. May I, can I add to this? Um, I, I think, again, this it's important that we have agility but um, the resiliency, um, uh, the, the motivations, uh, the courage uh, takes you to the target that you have, the goals that you have set. So um, those, those kind of things uh, is also very important to, to drive. So it's almost like projecting the, the visions and that, that visions become the beliefs uh, on, not only by the leaders, but also by the peers, uh, that they can actually, and especially if those vision is with, with the right purpose, then, then you, you'll be able to unite the team to go through all this um, rise and falls and learn, and rise and falls and learn, because there will be obstruction you know, totally along the way. So um, uh, one thing is that uh, it's good to manage risk, uh, but again, managing risk is looking from the fear point of view. So uh, that can actually keep you safe. So you have to make sure that along your journey, you have to have the fear factor to manage the risk. Mm -hmm. But what's actually get you from point A to point B is the courage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's see. Other questions? Ah, yes, I see right there. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Thank you for the great panel. Uh, I'm, my name is Danny. I'm from Istanbul. Um, dancing at the Hill is a lonely place, and I wanted to ask what kind of support system is necessary to keep you going uh, as a dancer in the Hill. Yes, it depends on the hill that you're dancing on. <laughs> hmm. uh, it, it really depends on what system, what structure we're talking about, what company you're running. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very different from one system to another because one system might need like a support system that other system wouldn't need. Are you an entrepreneur in Istanbul, in Turkey? Yes, yes okay. Well, um, being an entrepreneur is really hard. So and I used to go to uh, dinners when we were a couple, three years in. I have a really successful company. And I used to go to small group dinners and I used to say, I don't understand why anyone starts a company. And then people got mad at me. They were like, what are you talking about? Come on, you have a great company, things are going well. And I'm like, things are going well, but it is so hard. <laughs> so Michelle, what, what advice do you have? What well, right, so I'm just saying in the context of, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the room, and if you feel like, wow, this is so hard, you are not alone. Like, in, in many ways, if people knew how hard it was, they would never start it. But, <laughs> but, uh, if you keep going, and it's really hard typically, not always, typically from one to four years, okay? And it, it depends on the business and how fast your business is changing. But at some point, it starts to get easier. And it really starts to get easier typically when you get to about a $100 million run rate if you're a B2B company, because you actually have resources and you can recruit the executive you need, team you need to be able to scale your organization. Or if you're a consumer company, potentially when you get to kind of 10 million, 100 million users using your platform, because then it becomes really interesting. Again, executives that you need to come help you scale your organizations, you can then recruit. It's really hard to recruit those people before that. They would just don't take a risk on their career. But you as an entrepreneur, you believe in what you're doing, you show up every day to try and make it happen. And so that's why I think it's so hard. And so the question is, how do you get from A to B? Because again, there aren't that many companies, there's a couple, not very many companies who get to $100 million in revenue overnight. It takes years. And so some of the things you can do is, you can have co-founders. And you know the research shows it's better to have more than one person starting a company. Now, you go talk to some co-founders who don't get along and they'll tell you, yeah, the, it's better not to have a co-founder if you pick the wrong one. So there's another thing you have to figure out. You gotta find the right co-founders to help run your business. Uh, you have to assemble a great team. And then outside of work, you have to have investors that believe in you, that you don't feel like they're, they're, they, they have d misaligned incentives. And so at the end of the day, you, gotta, you have to, make decisions based on the people you're surrounding yourself with, whether it's business partners you're choosing, or it's your first employees, or whether it's people you're taking investment from, you really have to make sure your visions are aligned, because it will make your lives a lot easier, and it's already really hard for the next four years, and that helps make it easier. And then outside of work, I think either it's loved ones, it's friends, it's, you know, people have different setups. Some, some people's families are very supportive, and others aren't, because they think, what, you're starting a company? That's crazy. Like, go be a doctor. Go be an accountant, it's much safer. And so some people don't have the family support, others do. Other people might be in a relationship, other people aren't. And so outside of work, you have to find something. Um, you might wanna join Seven Cups, which is an online emotional you know, support system where someone just wants to listen when you're having a hard day. But I think those are some of the things you can do to help get you from point A to B. And again, it does get easier once you get over the hump, but it's really hard the first couple of years. And, and, but the, the thing that I like to say is, it's so hard, but it's also incredibly exciting. It's really messy building a company or being an entrepreneur, but it's also really fun. And it takes way more time, work, and resources than you can ever imagine. But if you achieve what you do, it's incredibly rewarding and impactful. And it's all six of those things wrapped up together. May I just, just add quickly? Uh, I was gonna say the same thing. Find partner. Um, but if you cannot find the right partner, okay, um, come to terms with the failure you know, shake hand with the failures. As we learn from failures, um, it become a stepping stone to a success. So you fail first, you will be the first to succeed, to succeed if you actually learn from the failures. So that, that, that kind of, that kind of uh, feeling, you have to overcome it. 
um, in terms of really facing your failures and then learning from it and then you progress more and then you will be the, the, the first one to get there because any success story never come easy. It's always come with a lot of determination. Any other wisdom from our panel? Yes, I'm trying, John, do you see any? Oh, I see a hand over there. Thank you. Um, the panel has talked about the very interesting and important role that values play in, in driving success and unifying an organization and so on. Uh, in this room and on the panel, we have people from uh, a lot of different countries, different cultures, different uh, political systems, different value systems, perhaps. And I'm wondering if you see um, any differences in value systems that may be troubling as we try to uh, form our businesses and, and pursue them. And if you see challenges there, how do, you, how do you see the best ways to address those challenges? Interesting. John? Uh, uh, well, I'll probably take a slightly different uh, tack. I mean, one of the things that, that I've found fascinating in China um, is meeting with some of the SOEs and the fact that they um, are very driven also by purpose, uh, mm -hmm. which has been interesting, and, and doing working with some of the uh, regions to, to look at lifting poverty or, uh, you know, so in some ways we can see big cultural differences, although in some ways you go around and see that there are some very common factors. I, I, think, uh, I think in most countries, and, and I, I suppose I have the opportunity to go to most places around the globe, I think we're seeing the same thing, that in, in most organisations that they, you know, being just driven purely for profit, now you can, you, you're not going to survive. So I, I'm, you know, we are seeing, and said that it was, it was really interesting to watch the, you know, the SOEs in China do this, that it really is that mixture of for profit and for purpose that you need both. Um, and, and so I think that, is, that actually is becoming uh, quite universal rather than just it's happening in some places and not in others would be probably where I'd answer that. Do you have a different perspective? You May can? I? Well, I, I, I probably, well, I, I, I would actually agree, um, but I also would add uh, um, these additional requirement or responsibilities that uh, imposed or enforced on the SOEs um, could also be partly regarded as a, a, a tradition, trans, transition process. I think if you look at the SOEs 40 years ago and SOEs today, you still find a lot of policy responsibilities for the SOEs, mm -hmm. and that's why sometimes we call the soft budget constraint. They don't even face a very hard budget constraint, but they do share more responsibilities. But you look at uh, compared to 40 years ago, that's been changing quite significantly. So I think eventually, in terms of the direction of change, we are in the same uh, direction. But, but I, I, I do think uh, as a part of uh, um, the SOE manager, you do have to answer uh, to some of uh, um, the policy requirement, maintaining social economic stability. That's a very important part of their job and maybe part of their value. Super chat. Yeah, I'll jump in a little bit. Um, in terms of uh, the values and cultural difference, maybe I'll make the comparisons. Uh, in case of the Eastern world and <coughs> say America. Um, in, in the Eastern world, uh, when you want to recruit someone, you try to understand how they treat their family. Okay, so uh, the, the children are taught to be very obedient and grateful to their parents, for example. Um, and and in, the, in America, in the Western world, um, you can see that parents actually um, become friends with the children. So it's very different style. Mm -hmm. but, but in the Western world, in, in that case, um, you will see uh, a very confident young child uh, raising with the respect even from their parents um, and um, a lot of creativity and innovations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the strength. Okay, now for the, for the Eastern world, maybe less innovate. I, I, would, I would not say, you know, in, in, in general, but uh, more obedience, more love and caring in, in terms of the family values. Um, 
but then, then and, and that's the, the sort of like dictate the, the, the corporate kind of culture as well. But if you can mix the two, we can take the best of the best, mix the two together. Maybe you have uh, even uh, stronger models. Uh, and this is the diversity is great in that sense that if you learn to pick the best and combine it, then, then it's probably become a, a, a stronger way. And I'm not trying to pick issues on US and China, okay? Uh, but I. <laughs> But, but always uh, pick the best thing and, and certainly uh, look at things from, from where you, you think it would be um, good. Your imagination and your visions actually dictate what would happen. Any uh, political decisions or le you know, leaders who make decisions, once those decisions or political decisions is actually capture the imagination of the mass, then they win the election, right? So um, what I'm saying here is that uh, with all this conflict as well between the, maybe the culture and also the interest of security, whatever interest between uh, the countries, for example, um, if we all in this room think positively that, well, the two economic power, sorry I get off to some other issues, but. No, it's good. Uh, it's good. If they can, if they, you know, if, if we actually, the power of our imagination is positive, they will call response to what we imagine it to be. Why don't we take one more question? I see a hand right there. Hi, uh, hi there. Um, I'm Jesse. I'm with the U.S. China Comedy Center. We use comedy to try to bring together China and people from outside of the world. Um, how do you lead in a situation when the rest of the world is determined to do the opposite of what you want to do? <laughs> do you have a specific idea in mind there, Jesse? So we're using comedy to try to bridge cultural gaps. And right now, the flow of history and the flow of process is against U.S. and China working together and laughing with each other. Uh -huh. But I think that that's actually what we need to do right now is to find a way to talk to each other and have a conversation where we're engaging as friends and friends laugh together. <laughs> Um, this time is most valuable time for my mission, and yet it's obviously harder than ever to try to succeed with that because a lot of powers that be are against that flow. So what do you do if your mission is heading in one direction and the flow of these you know, giant economic and global forces are heading in the second direction? Don't give up. How, <laughs> how do you know that uh, most of the people here don't feel like you feel? Yeah, I, I would argue. Already your, your, your question is already persuade people to think along your, your side. But I, and I'd argue that businesses are not thinking that way. I mean, I, huh. you know, I think businesses are wanting to, to work together and, and businesses are still playing very much a global game. So, I, you know, I, we will go through times um, and certainly not getting into any political, political debate, but, you know, I think... I think the flow of businesses wanting to work together and businesses seeing a more globalised world is unstoppable. So I, I, don't, I don't see it that, that way. Okay, practical, um, to add on to, to these ideas. So find a, you, like find a win. And so find a win and, and amplify it. And you just start with one win, and one win you'll get another one. And it doesn't need to be the government's talking to each other. Find a business. Find someone here who says, oh, actually, that's interesting. And go find someone else. And they could be two entrepreneurs. And all of a sudden, you have a story of a win. And you've assembled something more than you had an hour ago. And from there, keep going. And the thing is, is often these big successes seem like they're overnight successes. But they start with that first win. And if you can start there, you can build off there. I think you look back five years from now, you'll be back here in five years and you look back and be like, wow, now I have a really big company and you're going to be engaging with the government officials at that time. But you got to start somewhere and it doesn't have to be at the end game and, and build up from there. Professor? Uh, well, um, I do think that actually points to uh, a very important question um, about the leadership, which I think a lot about uh, lately, lack of uh, leadership in globalization. Now, China has been a key beneficiary of globalization uh, for the past 40 years, and I must say, U.S. has been the leader um, of that process. But now it looks like quite a bit uncertain what is going to happen. We don't know. Um, so I do think uh, 
whether it's for companies or for countries, uh, we do need to think about what it would be the best for um, the world. Even if the U.S. government has a slightly different opinion at the moment, I think we need to push ahead, even with regard to the U.S.-China trade talks. We had difficulties, but I'm sure there are some common grounds we can still find. Just give you a quick example. Um, there are areas where the U.S. is demanding China to do better protection of intellectual property rights, opening up the service sector, and also increasing the role of the market in allocation of resources in the Chinese economy. All these are exactly what the Chinese government identified a few years ago to do. So I, my own sense is that we still need to work together in that same direction, probably even accelerate what we have been doing. So I'm afraid I'm so Anas, you want to say something quickly? Yeah, I just wanted to add that there are so many uh, examples from history of entrepreneurs who came up with an idea like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, and their idea was invented ahead of the time. So it was them against the word, but a good leader will persevere and will know how to convince <coughs> others to join their vision. And this is like, that, that goes, goes back to the dance example. That's like the second the first person join, you join you in the hill to dance, and then the third person, and that's how you basically uh, grow and scale. So we begin with dance, we end, we end with dance. Um, I think one of the things I'm gonna take away from this conversation is that while we have definitely moved from a command and control world to a world of um, vision, leadership requiring vision setting and so forth, that the verities still apply. You have to have resilience, you have to be able to guide your company, and you have to think more globally than your own organization. So I want to thank our wonderful panelists. I want to thank you for your terrific questions. And please stay where you are. We have our closing session, and thank you.